Simon, welcome. Jason, thank you so much for having me. It's a big pleasure. I'm a, a longtime listener of your show and, and really admire what you do. So it's great to be able to catch up. Well, great to have you. Congrats on the book. The proof is in the plants. Great title. You have a great mission and that you're from my second favorite country, Australia. Yes, I am. I'm from Bondi in, in Sydney. So actually in the States now, like we were just talking about off air, I'm in, in Los Angeles and this is my second home because my dad lives here and I actually did grow up for eight years of my sort of early years, uh, in Texas and in Virginia. So I always love coming back here and, and connecting with everyone. Well, we love that you're here in the States. Interesting time to be here. We'll talk mm -hmm. about that in a minute. You know, we're not going to go there, <laughs> but, uh, let's start. You have like so many people at health and wellness. It all starts with an incredible personal story. So let's start with yours and the story of, of your dad. Sure. So I guess for me, when I was 15 years old, I, I saw for the first time what loss of health looks like. And I had been spending a, a Sunday afternoon with my dad and we were driving around a wine region actually in Victoria, out, outskirts of Melbourne. And this area is called the Yarra Valley. And we would often go out there and just explore different wineries and, and just have fun together. And on this one day we were coming back home and my dad started to experience some chest pain. And I could see that he was a little bit uncomfortable. And so I asked him if he was okay and he kind of downplayed it and essentially assumed a sort of position of denial and we proceeded to, to go home and we, we had dinner and I checked in again and, and he said that everything seemed to be okay. So I actually headed off to bed and not too long after I heard quite a bit of noise in the kitchen. And, and so I thought I'll go out and, and see what that is and check on dad in the back of my mind, thinking about what he'd been experiencing a few hours earlier. And. I went out and that was when it was very clear to me, Jason, that my dad was not okay. He, it was the first time that I'd ever seen my dad with you know, complete fear. I could just see it in his eyes and his facial expression. He was scared and he was only 41 when this was happening uh, on this day. And he had sort of made his way, scrambled over to get the phone to call the emergency number triple zero in Australia. And I actually took the phone and, and relayed the information to the paramedics and explained what was happening. And based on where we were, they said, we need to send a helicopter. So we were out in rural Victoria, a long way from the nearest hospital and this was, of course, you know, extremely frightening for me. Everything was happening very quickly. I was 15 and the helicopter came before I knew it. And they rushed in and, and scooped my dad up off the ground and put him on a stretcher and, and attached oxygen, sort of connected him to lots of different machines to check his vital signs, etc., and quickly took him to the helicopter. And I couldn't fit in the helicopter. There was not enough room. So they said that I would trail by ambulance and meet them at the hospital. And so that was a very long, uh, anxiety provoking, uh, car ride to the hospital. And by that time I phoned my, uh, mother and, uh, brother who they were actually staying in the city. I said that they better come to the hospital. This is what's happened. And so they made their way over and we got to the hospital and we waited and, and a doctor came out and, and said to us, your dad has had a severe heart attack. That was a shock for us because my dad didn't have any clinical diagnosis of any type of disease. He wasn't on any medications. He wasn't reliant on the healthcare system and he was just living the typical Australian lifestyle. And he wasn't someone that you would look at and say, that's a really unhealthy person. So it kind of, well, it did, it just took us by surprise how quickly this happened and, and how unexpected it was. And so the, the cardiologist that was speaking to us explained that they had saved his life. And of course, that's all we really cared about at that moment. But then the next day we really wanted to understand 
you know, how did this happen? And what's my dad's prognosis from here? Is he going to be okay? And so they sort of took us through what my dad's prognosis would be, that he would be on various medications, likely for the rest of his life. And they had taken my dad's history and my grandfather, so my dad's dad had also had a severe heart attack. His was when he was about 60. And so they said, the cardiologist said to my brother and I, I was 15 and my brother was about 18, young adults or nearly young adults and sort of said to us, we'll need to be screened for this as you get older and keep an eye on, on your risk as you're moving into your twenties and thirties. And this clearly runs in your family. And the conversation kind of ended there. And I think that through probably not through the fault of the cardiologist, but more we only had five or 10 minutes and I look back on that and wish that conversation had been expanded on because for me and for my brother, it was a little disempowering. We were left with this feeling of, well, we've been dealt a, a poor genetic card, most likely. And given that my dad didn't seem to be doing anything wrong, he was living his lifestyle as most young Australian fathers were. And he had a heart attack at 41. What's to say that it would be any different for us? And how's your dad today? He's great. He, he has made the most of his second chance. And I don't say that lightly because, you know, at the time I didn't realize how lucky my dad was, you know, sudden cardiac death is the most common cause of death from cardiovascular disease. And this often shocks people to hear, but. By definition, sudden cardiac death is usually someone develops symptoms, they don't have a clinical diagnosis, and within an hour or two of symptoms, they pass away. And so my dad was incredibly lucky, which is one of the reasons I do what I do today is I want people to have this information so that they can not wait for pain to act and they can feel inspired to take control of their health before something like this happens. Uh, but my dad today, you know, he has dramatically changed his lifestyle. He is, you know, exercising regularly. He's lost some weight. He, from a nutrition point of view, he eats a sort of very, very plant rich, I'd say Mediterranean diet. So reduced his meat consumption a lot. It's still there, but it's much more plant-based and I'm obviously super proud of that. Sure. Well, look, your story hits home, as I mentioned to you before the show, and some of our listeners may know, you know, my father died from heart disease when he was 47, when I was 19 years old. My maternal grandfather died from heart disease in his early 50s. So I, I have it on both sides and I'm actually turning 47 in a couple of weeks. So I, I take it very seriously. And to your point, I believe your genetics are not your destiny. And genetics are there and you have to deal with them. And yes, some people are blessed and, and others are not, but through nutrition, through lifestyle, there's a lot we can do to, uh, help reset the genetic stack, if you will, the concept of epigenetics. And so I'm, I'm glad we're, I'm glad we're talking about this and building off of your dad's diet. I like that you noted that he's plant-based. He still has meat, but you know, cut down consumption because you have this great line in the book, which I loved as we try to navigate through uh, the very strong opinions that are almost, almost like navigating through rel religious beliefs in terms of all the diets out there. And you say, quote, it's suddenly clear that the best diet for us is one, which 85% of its calories come from whole plant foods and any variation, whether it's keto, paleo, vegan, they can all deliver as long as, as long as it's plant predominant end quote, I, I like. I, I, I agree. It's like, whether it's 80, 85% or something up there, it's like, it's that, it's that simple yet. We seem to struggle with getting everyone on board with that. What do you think's going on there? Well, I think there is something about the fact that absolute sell and taking extreme positions can tend to be a little sexier and, and maybe it's also, uh, you know, virtue of the fact that sometimes oversimplifying a message. Uh, can be easier for, for someone to make sense of. But in reality, if you objectively look at the science and you sort of look into some of the nuance that exists in there, it does become very clear 
that each of those different diets can be done in a very health promoting way. And, and I think, you know, sometimes the focus on these dietary labels that we come up with, I understand where they can be helpful in certain circumstances, but I think in terms of the overall discussion about what a healthy diet is, sometimes they can be a distraction and really it can be more about what we disagree on with other people than what do we actually agree on? And let's focus on that because if everyone works towards improving their diet towards that, we're going to see huge changes in, in public health and we're going to see people adding a good high quality years of life to their lifespan, which is what this is all about. hundred percent agreed. It's uh, a little scary to see how health and wellness and politics are uh, a little close in terms of not really uniting around our, our common beliefs, but we'll get there. I hope <laughs> we will. So, Something you, what I love about the book is you kind of, you dive in on the nutrition side and look, if, if you think about the macros, if you think about what, what's in our food, you've got fat, you've got protein, you've got fiber, you've got carbs, you've got sugar. Can you kind of take us through how you think about fat, protein, mm -hmm. carbs, fiber, sugar, and how they fit into our diet? And then I always love hearing people's favorite sources. So I would love that as yeah. well. Cool. Well, I guess the first thing that I would say about those terms is that they don't speak to the quality of the diet. And those are umbrella terms. We know that a carbohydrate is everything from a jelly bean to a black bean. And the same goes for fat. It's an umbrella term for various different types of fats, which have varying effects on our health. And also the same can be said for, for protein as well. So let's slide through those. When it comes to carbohydrates, it is very clear that unrefined carbohydrates that are found in foods like legumes, even fruits and vegetables and, and whole grains, these are incredibly health promoting and across the board improve health outcomes, whether we're looking at things like cardiovascular disease or type two diabetes risk or fat liver disease, et cetera. On the other hand, refined carbohydrates which are your sort of white flour type products often used in cakes and, and biscuits and ultra processed foods, usually the foods in the center of the, the supermarket that are very heavily packaged. These increase our risk of a number of diseases. And there are a lot of different mechanisms as to how they do that. A couple of those are the fact that they're hyper palatable and that they're easily over consumed and, and therefore drive an, an, an excess of of calories, which results in weight gain, but also they, they're inflammatory. These foods are increasing inflammation in the body. They're not good for our microbiome and our gut lining. And as they increase inflammation, that is predisposing us to a whole range of chronic diseases, many that I just reeled off, which do have an inflammatory component. So, uh, when you're eating more of these whole unrefined carbohydrates, you are, you're providing your body with a whole host of different types of fiber, prebiotic fiber, resistant starch and polyphenols. All of these are substrates for your microbiome. And these, these, when I say substrates for microbiome, you can think of them as food for the bacteria that reside in your colon. And on the other hand, in the refined carbohydrates, much of this is stripped out. As they refine the carbohydrate, you lose a lot of that nutrition. And so one of the, the key benefits of these unrefined carbohydrates is that when they feed the bacteria that reside in your colon, in your large intestine, and there are trillions in there, they, these bacteria reward us. They produce compounds, metabolites, like short chain fatty acids, which are anti-inflammatory, which help keep, maintain the integrity of our gut lining and drive down inflammation. So that's carbohydrates, I'd say in a bit of a nutshell and why we want to be in increasing our consumption of unrefined and reducing our exposure to the ultra processed foods. 
if at any stage you want to jump into any of this, let me know. We can. No, we can no, see. keep on going. So you got carbs to close on carbs. What's your, you mentioned jelly beans and black beans. I'm assuming it's not jelly beans. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it's black beans. What's your favorite mm. healthy carb? So this is a, a, a good question and it kind of ties into protein. My, my protein consumption is I'd say relatively high, moderately high for someone consuming a sort of plant-based diet. And I do that purposefully because I'm quite active and I have performance goals. And so I actually lean more into legumes than I do into whole grains for that reason. And so beans and lentils and chickpeas and tofu and tempeh, foods like that, I'm eating on the regular. Uh, and then of course, fruits and vegetables are also providing some carbohydrates as well. Let's go straight to protein then. So protein, I guess from a, a, a definition point of view, we could, uh, break it down into animal protein and plant protein. We could even start to break down that further, but perhaps we start there. And I think it's pretty clear in, in the literature that in Western society, we have very much made animal protein, the hero of the plate. And we want to flip that. If we flip the thinking behind that and instead make plant protein more of the hero of the plate and animal protein can certainly still be there. It's just de-emphasized compared to the standard Western diet where, where 85% of current protein is actually coming from animal protein in, in Western diets as of today. So that would be the first thing that I would say where, as we're shifting or choosing plant protein a little bit more often, we are reducing our risk of various chronic diseases. In terms of how much protein do we need and where can we find it? The, you know, the, the sort of RDA, the amount of protein that someone needs for I guess, essential purposes and, and survival is around 0.8 grams per kilogram. And there's an argument there in science to support that protein consumption should be higher if we're wanting to promote lean body mass, particularly if you're someone that's active up, up around the 1.2 to, to two grams per kilogram of, of body weight. And you can certainly get there through either plant or animal protein or a combination of the both. And I just sort of reeled off some of those foods that where I'd be getting a lot of my protein from, you're going to get protein from all plants. And, and actually there is a, a, a little myth out there that certain plants are missing amino acids. And I actually used to believe this myself. I thought that you often here that said soy and quinoa are complete proteins. And there's an idea out there that what that means is they contain the nine essential amino acids, whereas other plants do not, they're actually missing an essential amino acid. That's actually not correct. So the, all plants contain all nine essential amino acids which is really important for people to understand it's a common point of confusion and a common question that I get, but they do contain these amino acids in varying ratios. And so the definition of complete and incomplete protein was really established around what's called a limiting amino acid. I don't want to go into too much of the weeds here, but the most important thing to understand is that an incomplete protein still contains all of the nine essential amino acids. But what it means is if you were to eat just that food, for example, just brown rice for all of your calories, I'm not sure how many calories you eat per day and you probably don't count. But if we just said someone eating 3000 calories a day, if they ate all of their calories from brown rice, they would fall short on the amino acid lysine. But as you can probably imagine, not many people in Western countries are doing that. And so really that definition of complete or incomplete protein is really only useful in third world countries or places where there is food insecurity. If you are eating with just modest diversity, you will get all of the amino acids in the required amounts. And the reason for that is that each plant will 
have a, have a different ratio of those essential amino acids. So you might be getting not not getting a lot of lysine in in rice, but you're getting a lot of lysine in beans, for example. Got it. So if you had to rank your plant proteins in terms of being the most complete, what's your favorite most complete source? Well, I think any of your beans or quinoa, soy is probably right up there as one of the best. So tofu or edamame or tempeh. But to be honest, I don't actually think about it so much like that. I just think about eating different varieties. I think about including whole grains in my diet, eating enough calories. And as long as you're doing that, and anyone can test this out using an app like Chronometer, where you can put your day of eating in. And if you put it in there and you eat sufficient calories for what your body requires, and you're, you have just modest diversity and you're eating legumes through at least a couple of your meals in the day, you will see that you get all of the essential amino acids in the amounts that you require. Got it. Interesting. So let's move on to fat. Fat. This is the one that I, I probably enjoy the, the most, you know, if, it's quite clear in the, in the literature that we want to avoid overconsuming saturated fats. We know that, that high amounts of saturated fat in the diet is clearly, has been clearly shown to increase the amount of LDL cholesterol in our blood. And, and we know from a whole lot of different types of science, looking at genetic studies, observational studies, clinical trials, that the higher your LDL cholesterol is and the longer you're exposed to that over your life, the higher risk you have of coronary heart disease. We also know that saturated fat increases insulin re resistance relative to unsaturated fats. We know that saturated fat, even in a diet where there is not an excess of calories, and this has been shown quite recently from a very eloquently designed study, that Saturated fat, even in a diet without an excess of calories, will increase hepatic fat. So fat buildup in the liver and, and fatty liver disease is now affecting around 25% of the population in, in America. So it's a big problem. So the saturated fat conversation, Jason, I think has been, has become confusing because there have been studies and you may have seen them that have come out and said, you know, saturated fats are actually not harmful. And, and I think people are left with this idea that nobody really understands if it is something we should be restricting. And I speak about this in the book, whether saturated fat is harmful or not depends what you're replacing it with. And this is super clear in the literature. So if you take foods that are rich in saturated fat and you replace them with foods that are rich in refined carbohydrates, it's a lateral move. Or if anything, it could increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. Whereas if you take foods that are rich in saturated fat, like fatty types of meat or even full fat dairy, and you swap those for foods that are rich in polyunsaturated fats, like fatty fish or nuts and seeds, or foods rich in monounsaturated fats or whole grains, you see a, a reduction in risk of heart disease. So what you replace a food with. And so that's how I would summarize fats. We want to reduce the saturated fats in our diet. It's not about getting none. You're always going to get some. We just know that as you're de-emphasizing them and you emphasize those unsaturated fats through those foods that I just sort of mentioned, whether it's fatty fish, like sardines and anchovies, if you eat fish or salmon or through nuts, seeds, avocado, that sort of stuff. It's the Mediterranean diet, essentially. Exactly. So fiber, and then we'll close with my personal favorite sugar. Yes. <laughs> so fiber, and we kind of touched on it a little bit there, but most of us are only getting 15 to 20 grams of fiber a day. And, and really the research shows we would do significantly better if we were getting 30 plus grams per day. And you're going to, you only get fiber in, in plants. There's soluble and insoluble fiber. The uh, insoluble fiber is, is what helps keep us regular. And the soluble fiber, as I mentioned before, is what feeds the, the microbiome. 
So many of the foods that we've reeled off so far, like legumes are super rich in, in fiber. And then you've got fruits and vegetables, of course, that contain quite a bit of fiber. Even nuts and seeds have fiber. One thing I would say with fiber is that we know that healthy individuals tend to have a very diverse microbiome. And there was a very interesting study that just came out of Stanford, actually, that compared a uh, great study. It was a, a randomized controlled trial that compared uh, a diet that increased fiber versus a diet that added fermented foods. I'm not sure if you've spoken about that on this show. So really interesting findings. And, and I think there's some good actionable takeaway points here for us. They had one, one group increase their fiber intake from 20 to 40 grams per day. And then the other group, and this was a 10 week study, the other group added six serves of fermented foods to their diet per day, quite a lot of fermented food. And that was like kimchi and kraut and, uh, yogurt and kefir foods like that. And what they were looking at was how does this affect the microbiome diversity? As we know that a more diverse microbiome is associated with better health. And then also, and this was really neat, they measured a whole host of inflammatory markers. So how do these foods affect inflammation and really modulate our immune system? And their hypothesis was that as you go from 20 to 40 grams of fiber, that will increase the microbiome diversity. And they weren't so sure about fermented foods. In fact, they actually found the opposite. And they found a few unusual things in, in the study. So the fermented food group across the board saw increased diversity in their microbiome and they had a, a dramatic reduction in inflammatory markers. So their immune system was working better. So the first takeaway point here is add fermented foods to your diet. Now in the high fiber group. What it was interesting, there was a very indi individualized response. And so some people actually saw an increase in inflammation and some people saw a decrease in inflammation. And I think, I actually think that this does make sense. They then went back and looked at the, the baseline diversity of the individuals, their microbiome diversity. And what they found was. Individuals who had a really poor, low diversity, so a really weak gut, they struggled with the increase in fiber and it actually increased inflammation. Whereas those that had a, a, a very diverse, well-equipped microbiome ecosystem, they were able to, they did quite well and actually saw a decrease in inflammation. So what this tells me, and, and I know these, the researchers are going into running another study is that depending on where someone's starting, it might not always be a good idea to just jack your, your fiber intake up from certainly from 20 to 40 grams. And I quite often hear this from people. The feedback is hey, I feel abdominal pain or, or bloating. And so I know the researchers are running another study and, and they're actually going to get people with a low microbiome diversity and feed them some fermented foods first for several weeks to see if that can help increase their diversity and then start ramping up fiber. Fascinating. Go get your sauerkraut. Yes. Yeah, uh... so, <laughs> go get your sauerkraut. And if you're finding that you're increasing fiber and you're, you're not feeling great, my recommendation to, from today's evidence is to back it off a bit and go slower and build it up over a much longer period. Very interesting. We'll, we'll close with sugar. Every, everyone's mm -hmm. favorite sugar. What role should sugar play? How do you think about sugar? Well, I think it's very clear that the sugar in, in fruit, for example, in whole fruit is not causing the diseases that we see today. I think if someone has say type two diabetes and they're very insulin resistant and they eat a whole lot of fruit, they can see a big spike in their blood sugar, but that's more representative of what's happening underneath at a cellular level. And it's really 
often kind of shooting the messenger. We know uh, consuming regular serves of fruit per day decreases risk of cardiovascular disease, decreases risk of type 2 diabetes, is associated with a, a longer life. Refined sugar, on the other hand, I'm of the view that we should be limiting our exposure to it. And largely because it's coming in, in, in foods that have had their fiber stripped away from them, the phytochemicals, we're losing that, that sort of value, that nutrition value from those food products. And as I said before, they are inflammatory. And so my advice for sugars is not to worry about the naturally occurring ones that are in whole foods, but certainly I, I don't think it's a good idea to be consuming a lot of these ultra processed foods with lots of added sugars. And I don't think we need to be adding a, a whole lot of sugar, you know, to our food. Agreed. Agreed. Moving on. I'm sure there are a lot of people listening who are saying, you know what, I, I should probably eat a little bit more plant-based and, and it, I think as you pointed out, we started the show, essentially, if we're going to eat 80 to 85% plant-based, we're, we're going to be in a really good shape. And so when someone starts in that path, you also have to be cognizant of your vitamins, your, your minerals, and, and I'm going to segue to iron and there's non-heme, which are plant sources of iron and heme, which are animal sources of iron, like, you know, mm -hmm. cross bed burger. And how do you think about and, and, and it's a little bit tricky if you're a plant-based diet, if you're eating a non-heme source of iron, like beans or just any other, any non-heme source, you got to think about combos to improve iron absorption. So can you, and I don't think most people know that. So mm -hmm. can you give us a little primer on, on how we should think about iron, specifically non-heme iron and how to optimize for absorption? Sure. And so iron deficiency is actually the number one deficiency in the world. So this is very important. I guess the first thing I would say here is that if your iron levels are normal and you've been eating in the same way for, for a long time, then I don't, I don't think you need to sort of over-focus on food combinations. Just keep doing what you're doing. But, but there are many people out there that do struggle with their iron levels. And this is where thinking about food combinations can be really helpful. A lot of the leading sort of iron sources from a plant-based point of view are your legumes, your dark leafy greens, even chlorella, which is, you know, more of a powder, but is very rich in, in iron. And also whole grains will provide iron as well. One of the best sources of iron per uh, 100 calories from a plant-based point of view is actually tofu. Now, there are a number of different aspects of our diet that can inhibit iron absorption in these foods or enhance it. So if you're someone that is struggling, these are the things that can be really helpful for, for you to look into. And I, I want to clarify, I'm kind of speaking to someone who is low in iron, but isn't anemic. If you're anemic, then you're going to want to work with your doctor or your nutritionist or your dietitian and think about supplementation. And that is just a reality for a number of people, no matter what diet people are following, there are a number of people that do need iron supplementation at various points, at least. From a, a diet point of view, in terms of inhibiting iron absorption, the most common ones that I see are, are tea, coffee being consumed at the same time as these iron rich meals and the, the tannins and the polyphenols in these drinks, as good as they are for you, uh, will inhibit iron absorption. And then on the flip side, the, the aspects of your diet that can help enhance iron absorption are vitamin C. So adding capsicum or bell pepper, or whatever you call it to your cooking, for example, which is a really rich in vitamin C can be a great food to throw into stir fries, for example, with your beans. Or it could be some lemon juice, or it could be strawberries. All of these are really rich in, in vitamin C and also garlic and onion. And this is one that some people do better with garlic and onion than others. It depends on where their gut health is at. But if you're someone that can tolerate garlic and onion, there are quite a few studies showing that both of these will increase the iron absorption in your food. One other thing that I, I should add in here is thinking about your supplements, zinc in particular, 
can block iron absorption. And also calcium really should be taken separately to, to iron supplements. But I think it's also something to be thinking about if you're uh, about to sit down for a really iron rich meal, not to have your zinc and calcium supplements just beforehand, trying to space them out as the, they sort of will compete with each other for absorption. Agreed. Agreed. Let's segue to another mineral, selenium. Mm -hmm. Why is it critical? And, and again, I'd love to hear some of your favorite sources. Selenium, like uh, iodine, is very important for thyroid health. So critical for our metabolism. Also a critical mineral for healthy hair, skin, and nails. And in terms of covering your bases with this from a, a plant-based point of view, you will get selenium in, in many different plants like mushrooms and, and some nuts and seeds. But I, I think I like people to think about adding Brazil nuts into their diet. They're a powerhouse, a selenium powerhouse. I actually like people to think of those as a supplement because they're so rich in selenium and it's important not to consume too much selenium as well because it can become toxic. So I like people to think about Brazil nuts as a supplement and to have sort of one, two, three a day on top of eating a nice healthy diet, not going to the bag of Brazil nuts and eating the whole bag, but that's not going to be a good idea. And you're going to over consume selenium. So just eating a very diet and, and getting that sort of two or three Brazil nuts in a day, and you will get all the selenium that you need. And so brain health, very relevant for a lot of people right now. There's a lot of amazing research. And the more we learn about lifestyle, we learn about nutrition. Specifically in the book, you talk about carotenoids and polyphenols. Mm -hmm. So can you walk us through carotenoids and polyphenols mm -hmm. and just give us a primer and how you think mm -hmm. about what they can do for mm -hmm. optimizing and for a healthy, a healthy brain? Love it. So the mind diet, people may have heard of it. It, it came out a group of researchers at a Rush University, Martha Morris was the one that came up with this. And essentially it's a blend of a Mediterranean diet and a DASH diet. Uh, it's a super plant-based diet, it has some fatty fish in there, but it has a real emphasis on dark leafy greens and berries for the reasons that you just said, for carotenoids and for polyphenols. And in fact, they found that in this group of around a thousand people that they followed who were between 50 and 90 years, People that were having a, a serve of dark leafy greens every day compared to those who were rarely eating dark leafy greens, they had brains that were operating as if they were 11 years younger when they tested their cognition. So I write in the book that this is a strong case for a daily salad. And that can be a mix of arugula, rocket and spinach and collard greens. Just make a big dark leafy green salad every day. And one of the reasons why the researchers think that dark leafy greens are so great is carotenoids, particularly lutein. And we, we know that lutein, which is fat soluble. So when you're having that salad, some olive oil, some avocado, or some nuts and seeds on it is going to help you absorb those carotenoids. We know from clinical studies now that have actually used lutein supplements at around 10 milligrams a day that you can get significant improvements in cognition. So research has been able to tease out that it may well be the lutein that is in these dark leafy greens, which is providing this long-term protective benefit. And the main reason that they, they believe lutein is protective is that it increases brain derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, which is like the fertilizer to the brain and helps stimulate neurogenesis, the production of new neurons. And, and also neuroplasticity, so more connections between existing neurons, which is really important for memory and for learning. So lutein, great phytochemical we want to be getting more of, and a really good reason for that big, dark, leafy green salad every day. I love it. I love it. And it, polyphenols. So we can touch on that, which was the second part of your question. So I mentioned in this mind diet, they place strong emphasis on berries and berries are rich in a particular polyphenol called anthocyanins. And I've been fascinated by polyphenols 
particularly over the last couple of years, because the emerging microbiome research is allowing us to better understand polyphenols. And why this is, is, is because these phytochemicals called polyphenols, of which there are a number of different types, only 5% of them are actually absorbed in our small intestine. 95% of polyphenols pass through and act as prebiotics for our microbiome. And our microbiome feed on these polyphenols and then they produce thousands of different metabolites. And these metabolites have been shown, they've shown these metabolites persist. After you consume, say, a, a cup of berries, these metabolites will persist in your blood for up to two days. And we have observational research showing that high consumption of berries is associated with significantly less risk of dementia. In fact, in Martha Morris's uh, same study as the one with dark leafy greens, they showed that people consuming just one serve of strawberries per day had 24% lower risk of developing Alzheimer's dementia. And again, we have short-term randomized controlled trials, both in children, in adults, and in elderly, showing acute benefits for cognition. So feeding certain subjects a berry smoothie, for example, comparing them to a placebo that's matched for energy and sugar, and then looking at their response time and their accuracy. And you can see that those that are, that consume the, the blueberry smoothie have brains that are functioning much better within the immediate period afterwards. So Berries are a quick win. They're a way for you to fire up your brain in your day to day. And they'll also protect your brain from long-term neurodegenerative disease. I love it. I'm going to close with my favorite section of the book where you talk about stressed out plants. So mm. can you explain to everyone what you mean by stressed out plants? What are they and why, why are they so critical? Yeah. So I've taking this from David Sinclair, who I write about in the book, who's a, a longevity scientist. Uh, but essentially, and, and we were just speaking of berries, so maybe that's a good example. These polyphenol compounds like the anthocyanins, they're what give the berries that dark pigmentation. And that dark pigmentation is real part of the plant's natural defense system. It's its response to the environment around itself. And so this is actually one of the reasons why we believe, and studies have shown this, that organic fruits and vegetables tend to be a little higher in antioxidants and polyphenols than conventional. And perhaps that's because they're made to fend for themselves a little more. They're not in perfect, neat rows and they're not, you know, sprayed with as many herbicides and insecticides. And so they have to uh, fire up their defense system a, a little bit more. Now, the idea with xenohormesis essentially is built on this idea of what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. And so these compounds that are part of the plant's natural defense system are, are thought to create a little bit of micro stress in our body. And we adapt to that. And as we adapt, we're, we're activating these disease resistance pathways. And so we're reducing our risk of neurodegenerative diseases, cardiovascular diseases, the list goes on. So this is, that was a fun part of the book. Xenohormesis is a really, it's a theory of aging. And one of the theories about what these phytochemicals are and perhaps how they're providing their benefit. But I, I, I will say that. This is very emerging science. There's so much more science to, to come to understand what these phytochemicals are actually doing in our body. And there are five to 20,000 of these different phytonutrients. So there's a lot of research to be done, but it's certainly a, a, a very interesting theory. Well, Simon, thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. As I uh, said at the start, big honor to come on your show. I'm a, a huge fan and longtime listener. So. I really appreciate the time and, and thank you for everyone for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. You're very welcome. Thanks. Thanks for your kind words.